Okay, I think we'll get started. So hi everyone, my name is Sophia Pascuzo. I am the Customer Marketing Associate here at RKL eSolutions. Thank you everybody for joining today's webinar, Integration Best Practices. A few things before we get started, all mics are turned off, so please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen for any questions. We will try to answer all questions throughout or at the end of the presentation. Today, we welcome Scott Halra. Scott is the founder and managing partner of Venn Technology. He has more than 16 years experience in the business technology industry and more specifically in CRM and accounting software solutions. Scott founded Venn Technology in 2015 to help small and medium-sized businesses get their name, time and sanity back by building integrations between Sage Intact and anything with an API. Venn's top priority, build solutions that free people to focus on what they're best at. And with that, I'll let you take it away, Scott. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> appreciate everybody making time for this. Um, we're humbled and honored to be kind of the final bookend to the, the summer, uh, summer series that RKL has put on. So thank you guys so much for having me. Um, quick agenda, three main things. I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about uh, me and my firm. We won't spend too much time there. Um, and then want to take you through what we view as four different ways to actually integrate your applications. And then finally, we'll we'll wrap up with some best practices and considerations before you actually begin your integration project. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm not sure where everybody's at. Uh, we are based just outside of Dallas, Texas. Um, if there's any other fighting Texas Aggies uh, on the call, whoop. Um, I'm a very, very proud uh, graduate of the, the May School at Texas A&M. Um, as as uh, Sophia said earlier, um, a lot of my experience involves Salesforce.com and Sage Intact. Um, we have worked, I have worked in just about every industry vertical you could name from construction to uh, healthcare, nonprofit, finance, retail, hospitality, um, software, technology, we, we've, we've touched it all. Um, and, and something we'll dive deeper into is that kind of um, a big part of who we are as an organization at Venn is that we really try to take a big picture kind of macro look at systems and the integrations as opposed to a, a micro look at, at um, uh, just system A and B. And again, we'll, we'll talk more about that here in a minute. Um, at Venn, again, our, our, what we live for is creating systems that free you to focus on what you're best at. Um, we come across a ton of burnt out uh, finance professionals who, um, you know, they, they can't get to their kid's soccer game because they're burning the candle at both ends. And, um, we, we want to come in and automate those processes to, to get you back to uh, doing what you're best at so that you can thrive both in your, your work and your, your personal life. Um, again, there's, there's kind of two main parts to our business. Um, we're a Sage Intact Marketplace partner, and um, we will help connect anything with an API to Sage Intact. Um, and then the other side of our business is our Salesforce.com consulting practice. So um, if, if organizations are moving to Salesforce or maybe they already use it and just need help using it better, uh, that's where our firm comes in. Um, a quick note on this. I recognize that those of you on the call today uh, are using a variety of different systems and those systems may or may not include Sage Intact. Um, I'm gonna reference those throughout the, the discussion or at different parts. And my intent is not to promote any one product, but just to kind of give some examples and context um, kind of based on our, our experience. And my hope is that if I say Salesforce, you can insert your CRM, or if I say Intact, you can you think of it uh, through the lens of, of your accounting system. Uh, these concepts are really interchangeable. Um, it, it's not specific to, to these systems. All right, so with that, let's get underway. Um, it is 2022, and before we know it, it is going to be 2023. And um, if you're like most organizations, you use a ton of different apps uh, to, to operate. Um, we've, we've got the screen there on the right, and these are some that we come across on a, on a frequent basis with our customers. Um, your stack probably looks very different, but it is a uh, full and varied stack, no less. Um, 
So in 2022, it is our firm belief that apps should work together. We shouldn't have to manually key things. We shouldn't have to deal with these arduous processes. And so um, what, what could that look like? Well, let's take an example of an e-commerce company that uses a shopping cart like Shopify or maybe use WooCommerce or Magento. Um, regardless, you, you've got these orders. And um, oftentimes when an order is placed, we need to get that order and the relevant customer information into our CRM so that we can track who our customers are. We can continue to, to market out to them uh, when we want to sell new products and services. But then there's also a, a financial transaction that needs to get recorded. And so, uh, you know, we, we've now got three systems. And then finally, maybe you're using something like Teams or Slack to communicate internally. And maybe it's important to, to tell people that an order has been received. Um, this is a very, very doable workflow, something that we see and do on a regular basis. Or uh, maybe your organization puts on big events and you've got an event management system like Cvent. And again, we, we've got tie-ins to other applications. Um, we're, we're obviously going to promote this event to our customer base and prospective customer base. And we need to know within the CRM who's coming because we're probably not going to give all of our salespeople access to the event system. Um, and, and we need to then record the revenue from that. And so, again, we, we need something uh, that, that takes place in one system to potentially impact uh, multiple applications without having to have a person uh, manually manually touch and, and do this. Um, but why? Like, why, why is that important? Why am I even talking about it? Um, I would imagine that this is common sense, but I'll, I'll just go ahead and throw out kind of how we see things. Um, first thing is that these manual processes are time consuming. You, you've got better things to do with your time than, than hand key or or, or you know, deal with the mishmash of, of getting data across. Um, and, and the other thing is that this is an error-prone uh, way of going about things. The more that you, quote unquote, touch the data, the more likely that something gets fat-fingered or that something could go wrong. Um, and then the other side of this is that if, our, if we're relying on manual processes to sync our data across systems, we are not not having timely insight into critical metrics, and this could cause you to make uh, make the wrong decision, make a bad decision. Um, we, we've got to get our data into and across systems timely so that we can make good choices for our, our business. All right, so we're going to do our, our first poll. We've got two polls back to back real quick, and I just kind of want to get a sense for the audience here. On a scale of one to 10, how well integrated would you say your systems are? One means I want to smash my keyboard with a rock. And 10 is a very zen-like, I just think about my data and it just magically appears in, in the place that I want it to be. So if we could launch that poll, there we go. Um, uh, if you would just take a minute and uh, fill that in. Hopefully we've got a lot of Zen-like people and not uh, not angry folks on the call. And Sophia, how are we doing? I'll share the results right now. Great. Okay. It's a fairly even distribution and i'm pleased to see that we've got some eights and nines nobody counted themselves a 10 that's okay um we're an integration firm and i wouldn't quite say that we're a, a 10 either so eights and nines are great and we've got two of you that uh, are ready to smash your computers so please don't do that your boss won't like it um but appreciate your your honesty and candor and that kind of gives me a sense for um where where y'all are at all right, so our next question, ballpark, don't, don't overthink this. How many applications do you think you have in your organization today? We've got some, some ranges there. Take just a minute and fill that out. And y'all don't know it yet, but you're going to help me um, potentially uh, validate a statistic that I, I recently heard.
All right, Sophia, do we have enough responses? I think so. I'll launch okay. it now or All right. show the results. <laughs> There we go. All right. One, five or fewer. We've got a few of you that are in the six to 15 range. Um, and wow, there are some of you that are in the more than 50 category. Okay. Well, that is really helpful. Um, so moving on, a couple of weeks back, uh, myself and our marketing team attended the HubSpot inbound conference in Boston. And their CEO during her keynote got up and said that the average company has 242 SaaS applications today. And that, that number seems a little high to me, um, but some of, you, uh, some of you definitely said that you're using more than 50. So um, maybe it is more uh, realistic than I, than I thought. But even if that number is 10%, if the, the real number is 10%, that is still a lot of systems generating a lot of data. So, whether it's two systems, 10 systems, or 200 systems, the, the next thing that she said, I think, is, is just really, really important. And I'm not going to read this quote word for word, um, but right there in the second sentence, the real problem is that they're disconnected. And because of this disconnection, your, your people are struggling and your customers are struggling. And so, you know, we, we want to come in and help you guys wrangle this, this monster. So that sounds great, Scott, but how do we get there? How do we do this? Well, let's take a minute and we're going to talk about four different methods, four different approaches to integrating our systems. I've already kind of alluded to the first one, and this is definitely not an automated integration, but it's been around uh, since the dawn of computers and much to my chagrin, it probably will be around uh, <laughs> forever. Um, it's our good old export import. Um, we're partway through the week. I don't know if anybody's running payroll this week, but my guess is that at least some of you on this call at some point this week or, or next coming up on the end of the month, uh, you've had some kind of export import uh, just, just for payroll or, or maybe something else. And hey, um, it's free, right? Free in air quotes because it definitely takes your time, but there's, there's no, no monetary cost to it. But on the downside, this again can be time consuming. Um, when we export that data, we may have to go in and change the date formats so that the, the target system will accept it, or maybe we've got to do some kind of other transformation to, to get it in. Um, and then it, like we talked about earlier, this can be error prone. And we've seen that error prone thing happen in a couple of different uh, ways. One is that we, like I said earlier, we fat finger something in a cell and now we've, we've totally messed everything up and we're, we're pushing bad data into our target system. Um, and then the other thing that we've run into is duplication. Uh, story I like to tell, this was probably six or seven years ago. I was working with a, a, a fairly large nonprofit down in Austin, Texas, and they, for whatever reason, just didn't want to fully automate the, the process. And so we came in and we helped them define this, uh, this export process for getting their donations out of CRM into the accounting system. And, you know, we warned them about some potential risks with this. And within a week of them launching, they called and said, hey, um, we might need to talk about that automated thing after all. Um, so-and-so was out this week and I didn't realize they had already exported these records and we, we had some overlapping dates in the files that we imported. And now we've got the spaghetti in our system. We don't know what, um, you know, what we really need to back out and, and what's correct. Um, so, uh, you got to watch out for that. You got to have really good communication among your team when you're doing this. Um, for, for all the dogging that I've done on this, um, I, I do have to say, sometimes this is it. This is your only way. And it sure beats hand keying the data in. Um, but we like to help people avoid that wherever possible. Our next option is what we're going to call a packaged integration. And what I mean by this is that it's kind of this off the shelf, um, plug and play, maybe too strong of a word. But, but the, the, the bulk of the integration work is already done. Maybe you need to go in and change some field mappings, but, but a lot of it's already you know, put together for you. 
And man, these are typically the fastest way to get integrations done. Um, they, they, they typically are, are way quicker than the next two options that we're going to talk about. And the other great thing about these is that oftentimes there is a software publisher that is going to make updates and add functionality to this over time. So it may start off as, hey, it only does this thing, but eventually it may come to do multiple other things. Um, but things that you really need to think through before going down the route of a package integration is, does this actually fulfill the requirements that your organization has for the integration? And the next thing is, you need to take a look at what you have done to your systems from a customization standpoint. If you've just added a few fields, probably no big deal. But if you've gone and customized things a lot, these packaged integrations may not play well. They're typically um, made to, to work with a very, very specific structure in, in the applications that they're, um, that they're connecting. And so I, I like to tell stories. I've got my own. Uh, in our organization, surprise, surprise, we use Salesforce as our CRM. And years ago, we started using MailChimp to do some of our, our customer communications. And we went out and we found this great um, uh, MailChimp connector for Salesforce. And great thing about it, that one was actually free. Sometimes these package integrations, they're, they're paid for. It's a subscription. Uh, this one was free, which we thought was going to be just fantastic. And when we got into it, we realized that we have a certain way of tagging our contacts and, and kind of segmenting our, our database. And this package integration, although it was free and although it, it did get data across, it didn't bring our tagging over. And we weren't able to actually segment and send the right communications to uh, to our database um, be, because it didn't have the awareness of that part. So again, these package integrations can be fantastic. And, and when they meet your needs, this is this is the, the way that we almost always recommend people go, but you really have to think through what it's gonna do and what it's not gonna do. Kind of tagging on to that, an exercise we like to go through, and frankly, we like to go through this, whether we're talking with somebody about a package integration or uh, a more customized integration that'll again follow these kind of next two buckets. We really need to lay out what are the what are the objects or what are the tables in our systems that we need to exchange data with, and and so really simple exercises just to do something like this create you a little graphic. Okay, what what data are we getting from what objects and which way are we syncing, and then go through the documentation for the packaged integration and see how well that's actually going to, to align with your business requirements. All right, our next integration option is custom code. And, and I think that for a lot of us, when we think about integrations, I think that this is where most people's mind goes to. It's that developer uh, with the text editor uh, cranking out lines and lines and lines of code. And the great thing about the custom code approach is that you can get exactly what you want as long as the APIs for both systems support uh, that, that use case. But other things we've got to kind of weigh here are that usually we've got to have a, a team of developers. Developers are expensive. They're in high demand. They're hard to find. And, and typically, this is going to take the longest and cost the most. And then the other thing we have to think about is down the road, as we need maintenance or as we need to make a change, um, even a simple field mapping can, can be a, a pretty arduous exercise. We got to go find that developer. They got to dig through thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of lines of code, find that one spot, make those tweaks, and then deploy those changes from a development environment into a test environment and then into your production environment. And those simple changes could could take weeks or, or longer to, to get made. Um, the fourth option is um, something called IPaaS, or for those of you that have been around a while, you might be more familiar with the term middleware. This is software that sits in between software and acts as kind of the pipe that the data flows through. And this is where um, our trigger events and the logic take place and any transformations. And the great thing about 
this approach is just like the custom code, as long as the APIs are there, you can get just about whatever you want. And we, we have this ability to kind of configure, it's, it's a low code, no code approach. We have the ability to configure our integrations. And, and usually it gives us the ability to string together multiple systems uh, in, in one workflow. So the examples I gave earlier where we're taking our, our order data from e-commerce, pushing to CRM, pushing to finance, and then notifying people in Slack. These tools are very, very adept at handling those kinds of cases. Now, having said that, just like you've got an annual subscription for your accounting system or your CRM or your e-commerce, you are going to have an ongoing cost to this tool. So it's definitely something you have to budget for. And from a, from a functionality uh, standpoint, um, while, while the publishers of these iPaaS solutions are certainly making updates and enhancements and adding capabilities to the tool set, it's really up to you to go and do something with it. You've, you've got to go in and, and build that. Whereas with the, the packaged integration approach that we talked about earlier, um, typically the publisher pushes that out in an update and you know within a couple of clicks, you're, you're getting value out of those, those enhancements. So um, I will tell you, there is not a perfect approach. There is not a one size fits all approach. Um, you just kind of have to, to weigh what's out there and available. All right, so great. We, we've talked about different ways to uh, to actually make these integrations work from a from a technology standpoint. But what do we need to know before we start heading down this path? All right, first thing, something we like to say in our firm: no vague requirements. We get calls on a regular basis from people that say, "Hey, we need to connect Salesforce and Sage Intact." Great. What does that actually mean for for your organization? Well, we, we just want the systems to talk. We, we just want them to exchange data without having to, to do anything. Fantastic, I understand that, we, we can help you, but let's get really specific. So um, a more specific example is, is there on the bottom. Um, we need to send closed one opportunities from CRM to accounting, and we need to push them in as sales orders. And when we push that sales order in, we need to know the right customer that it's associated to, and we gotta make sure that we have the right items on the order. And then we wanna take those paid invoices and send them back to the CRM so that sales knows who has paid and who hasn't. Um, it's kind of hard to work with the top example. The bottom example really, really gets us focused on what we actually have to do. Next, all right. I love it when we get four or five people in a room in a, in a kickoff or in a workshop where we're talking through the, the workflow, talking through the process. And um, what, what happens more often than I would like is that we ask person A, hey, tell, tell me, tell me how, to, how this process works. And we're, we're trying to draw it out on the whiteboard and we, we get it drawn and, and, and person B goes, what are you talking about? That's not how we do it. We do it like this. And so we come and we rework the lines on the on the the dry erase board, and then person three goes, "Y'all are both wrong. This is how we do it." So in order for these automated integrations to work, your teams have to be on the same page as to how the process works. These work great when we stick to the process, but when we start to deviate, things can break down really easily. Um, kind of in line with this, um, you know, process discussion is we really need to think about where the integration starts and stops. Um, I, I referenced earlier that at Venn, we, we take this macro approach to integrations. And, and let me dive into that a little bit more. We, we will get calls frequently from people that say, I need to connect CRM and accounting. Great, we can do that. Tell me more about your organization. What do you do? Are there systems that are feeding into your CRM? And are there systems that come after your accounting system? What do I mean by that? Um, we, we talked earlier about the uh, event registration. Um, we talked earlier about the, the e-commerce. Another example is, is in the nonprofit space. Almost every nonprofit has some sort of online fundraising system. 
And those online fundraising systems usually push into your donor management. And then, of course, you need to get those uh, transactions re recorded in the accounting system. Well, we'll get a call from people to say, hey, can you connect our donor management and accounting? Yep, great, we can. Um, but we have to actually start thinking about the, the front end, end of this process. Where, where all do you get donations from? Oh, well, we get checks that come into the office. We have a lockbox and we've got this online um, fundraising system. Great. So we've got to start with when, when somebody in the donor development group goes and creates a new fundraiser, we need to create that fundraiser over in the uh, donor management system. And we need to create some representation of that fundraiser in the accounting system so that we know where to tie the revenue and expense. So when you go into this, think about the source systems that are feeding into the core applications. And then also maybe there's some sort of um, order management or fulfillment system that, that's gonna come after the accounting. You know, we gotta make sure that we can send things all the way downstream in order to, to close the, the full process. Um, the next thing when it comes to, to process is when should the integration run? Um, do we want this to, to go and run every night at midnight? Go grab all the transactions from yesterday and push them in, in batch. Or do we want this to happen based on a trigger? Maybe when somebody executes their DocuSign, you want to go get the order schedule and, and push it into accounting. Um, we, we can do that. Um, or another approach is that we do it with a button press. We want somebody to put eyes on this. We want somebody to review it to make sure that things are accurate. Um, and and we'll, we'll actually run this based on a human saying, yep, this is good to go. All right, next item, data quality. We've all at some point heard the expression garbage in, garbage out. And where this kind of originated was in the, the realm of reporting, right? If we put bad information into the reporting system, uh, we're going to get bad data out of it. But this, this statement is still very, very true in the integration sp space. Um, if, we, if we have bad data in our source system and we push that to our target system, we're now going to have a mess in both places. So things to watch out for. Do you have duplicates? How many versions of Acme Inc. do you have in your source system? Um, go in and get those cleaned up so that you don't wind up with a whole bunch of Acme Inc. in your, in your target system. Um, and then from there, we want to make sure, is the data that we have accurate and up to date? Do we have the old shipping address for uh, this organization? Do we have gaps in our data? Are we missing a a billing contact in our source system that, that we need to fill in in order to, to flow down into accounting. Data quality is really, really important. Um, next thing, common identifiers. So for your master data, you need common IDs so that when we say um, this is the customer that we're, we're processing an order for, all systems in the chain need to, to consistently understand who that customer is. And something that you may need to do before you take on a project like this is establish common IDs across these different systems. You may need to go through an exercise to say, um, you know, here's the customer number in our accounting system for uh, Bill's chip supply. And you may need to go do a, a one-time update in your CRM to make sure that your CRM knows who you're talking about as well. And, and this would apply not just to customers, but to your vendors, your products and items. If you've got uh, departments or locations or warehouses, uh, you're gonna need those common identifiers across, uh, across applications. All right, we got two more to talk about. The next thing is uh, limitations. So in, in the SaaS world, it is very common for SaaS publishers to have governor limits that, that ensure that we don't have one company monopolizing all of the system resources. Um, I'll, I'll talk about Salesforce for a minute. Um, Salesforce is used by thousands and thousands and thousands of companies, ranging from small organizations to you know, the Fortune 500. And they want to make sure that General Motors isn't taxing 
the infrastructure so bad that other people are having performance issues. And so one of the things that they'll often do is put in a limit on the number of API calls that can be made in a given period of time. And so one thing you have to think about is how much data are we thinking we're going to process and, and how many API calls does that translate into for, for a typical period of time? And that may cause you to say, you know what, we need to do things in batch on a schedule and we can't really do them on, on a real-time basis because we've just got too much volume and we're going to exceed our API calls. Or, or maybe you're okay with that and, and you need to talk to the vendor about uh, paying more to get more API calls so that these things can happen. Um, another that we run into is simultaneous connections. So um, sometimes these applications will only let you have one open pipe at a time. And if you've got multiple systems that need to feed in, you need to think through some sort of queuing or how you're going to handle concurrent requests going into uh, that application. And then finally um, is maintenance windows or, or outages. So how does the integration work when, when there is an outage, when, uh, when you can't actually connect to that, that target system? Um, what, what happens? What are, what are the retry mechanisms? Or if we're running on a schedule and we know that every Friday night um, the, the, there's scheduled maintenance, well, maybe we need to run our schedule uh, in, in such a way that we know it's going to happen outside of that maintenance window. Finally, test, test, test. Yes, I am shouting and getting louder. Um, we, we, we run into this. In fact, we ran into this not too long ago. We had a client uh, who we, we deployed back in December of last year. They signed off on our testing documentation saying we have tested, everything is good. And the reality is they actually didn't. And because they didn't, they didn't come across some edge cases, which created a lot of pain for them down the road. Um, and, and some of that should have been brought up the, in, in the requirements gathering, um, but, but it didn't. Sometimes that happens, and that's why the testing is so important. So we don't want to go and build our systems or our integrations to handle all of these edge cases, but we do need to have a plan for what we're going to do when one of these does uh, come up. So, um, and then other things to, to think about are making sure that you've got validations in place upstream. So an example of this, um, maybe you've got this field in your mapping and the, the, the target system needs to know, it needs to uh, be a numeric value. Well, you might need to go and, and put some rules in place in your source systems that say, hey, I'll never collect any text values. This always has to be a number so that downstream, we know what to do with it. Um, and then finally, you, you need to make sure you put the system through some rigorous paces. Um, hit it hard because you don't wanna go live and then find out that there are, are problems with it. Um, we talked earlier about no vague requirements. You need to create really well-defined test scripts so that people know, hey, when these things happen, this should succeed. Did that happen? Yes. If I put it in a different way, this should fail. Did that happen? Yes. Okay, we're good. Um, so, so make sure you know very clearly what it is you need to be testing for. Um, something that we see on, on a somewhat regular basis is that we have organizations that um, will we'll actually have production systems pointing at a sandbox. So uh, a quick example, within the Salesforce world, the intact world, we, we have the ability to create these uh, test environments or sandboxes. And what we've done on a number of uh, cases is we'll have, uh, let's say it's e-commerce, we'll, we'll have Shopify um, pushing real order data into the, the intact sandbox. So we can continue to operate, we can continue to function, but we, we get some time to see how this is actually working in a, with a major safety net. We're, we're, we're pushing all the data into this sandbox system. It's not going to mess up our financials. And over the course of a week or two weeks or a month, we can actually track and see, are we getting what we expected?
So I can't underscore the importance of testing uh, highly enough. Um, with that, I have talked enough. Let's open it up for questions. Great, thank you, Scott. So now, yep, we're gonna open up the floor for questions. And it looks like we might have a couple here. So the first one, how long should an integration project take? Uh, <clears throat> love that question. And um, <laughs> I, I wish that there was like a silver bullet, hey, it should always take this long. And the reality is it, it depends on so many different factors. How many systems are we connecting? Um, how many parties need to be involved? I can tell you just as kind of like a, a frame of reference for us, um, if we're dealing with a packaged integration, oftentimes it's four to eight weeks. And when we're getting into things that are a little bit more custom, those typically tend to run uh, more like, like, like 90 days. So uh, we've certainly had some that took less and we've certainly had some that took longer, but hopefully that gives you a good frame of reference. Great. And another one here, if you have more than two applications that need to be integrated, how do you determine which ones to start with? Um, so my, my thought there would be that, again, there is no right or wrong answer. I, I think I would just start with whichever ones are causing you the most pain. And, and if the, the systems overlap with one another, if there's this kind of logical uh, chain where it's, it's linear and it needs to go A to B, B to C, C to D, um, you, you might actually need to, to do things all at once. Um, but if, there, if you don't have that kind of linear flow, you, you probably just need to look at it and say, which one is causing us the most pain um, and, and what pain do we need to solve for uh, fastest? Awesome. Okay, uh, as of right now, I'm not seeing any more questions. I'll pause for a few seconds, just see if we have any last minute ones. Okay, well, Scott, do you have anything else? Um, no, I'll just close with this. Um, if you're considering taking on a project like this, we're here to help. Um, uh, we've got our QR code up there or just go straight to ventechnology.com. Uh, we'd love to talk with you. Thanks, everybody. Great. Yes, thank you. Um, so for everybody attending today's webinar, we're going to send out an email with the slides and a replay video in the next couple of days, and we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.